Okay, so I think we should start because the numbers have stabilized and this will give you more time and more time for us to listen to your talk. So, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Shafi Goldwasser. I'm the director of the Simons Institute and um, for the theory of computing. And as you may know, the Simon Institute was established in 2012 by a very generous gift from the Simons Foundation. And uh, it's my really very great pleasure to welcome you to a new seminar series. Uh, a, the speaker today is the second speaker in the series called the Breakthroughs Lecture Series, which highlights substantial uh, advances in the field of theoretical computer science. And uh, we look forward to this talk and for convening the series in person in Calvin Lab starting this fall. Right now we're still in the Zoom mode, although we have a quantum cluster that's going on at uh, Simon's in person right now. Um, I, what else would I like to say? Um, uh, something about the Q&A. So people should free to feel free to pose questions um, in the Q&A link uh, at, the top, at the bottom of your Zoom page and uh, at appropriate times we will refer to them and the speaker will answer them. Our speaker today, the main feature and the most important part is Yuan Si Chen and Yuan Si is an assistant professor in the Department of Statistical Science at Duke University and previously was a postdoc fellow at ETH. Um, and in 2019, he obtained his uh, PhD from Berkeley, um, the Department of Statistics uh, advised by uh, Binyu. So he, in fact, uh, Yuansi told me what is Berkeley time, which I um, <laughs> forgot <laughs> since we've been so for so long out of the loop uh, in doing things in a standard way. And he graduated before that from the Ecole Polytechnique in France in applied mathematics. And his main interests are statistical machine learning, MCMC sampling, optimization, domain optimization, and statistical challenges that arise in, in the computational neuroscience, and probably much more. And today, uh, his talk is entitled An Almost Constant Lower Bound of the Isoparametric Coefficient in the KLS Conjecture. And uh, instead of me explaining uh, what the result is and what the history is, I think that we are going to be benefit much more from Yuan Si himself telling us the background for this uh, conjecture and what he's shown. And we are extremely uh, excited that you were willing to give us this talk and want to hear about your breakthrough. So please uh, take the stage. I'm going to mute myself. And you should unmute yourself. Okay. okay. Uh, thank you, Shafi, for the nice introduction. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming to my talk. Uh, it's uh, it's a great honor for me to talk uh, give a talk at the Simon's Institute. Actually, during my six years at uh, uh, UC Berkeley for my PhD, the Simon's Institute has always been a, a great source of uh, ins inspiration and a great place actually to spare an afternoon. Or, yeah, it's uh, it's been great. So it's a great honor. Uh, now I can give a talk here. So today I'm going to talk about the uh, almost. Uh, constant lower bound of the isoparametric coefficient in the KLS conjecture. So the KLS conjecture uh, dates back to uh, 1995, and it's an important conjecture in uh, theoretical computer science, and I will explain. So um, I will divide this talk into four parts. I'll first uh, explain a little bit the history and the related problem to the uh, KLS conjecture. So the KLS actually is named after three uh, Authors, Kanan, Lovax, and Simonovich. Um, this has uh, uh, many important implications uh, in theoretical computer science and statistics. Um, and then in the second part, I will explain the high level ideas actually in the original proof of the KOS uh, paper, 1995, where you, they introduced a technique called the localization lemma technique. And then in the third part, I will introduce, I will introduce this. Uh, uh, Eldon Stogas localization scheme is actually a technique we use actually in our paper to get uh, the current best uh, uh, lower bound of isoparametric co coefficient in the KLS conjecture. So um, this this technique was invented in like 2013, and then in the last part I will explain the progress in our paper. So uh, yeah, so the the, the, the lecture series type called breakthrough, but for me I think. The, the real breakthrough already happened when Eldon introduced uh, this uh, very like fancy and very sophisticated uh, proof technique in 2013. And uh, yeah, so I will make sure that actually 
um, we get a uh, good uh, compa uh, comparison understanding of the, the second and the third part. And so the, the, the first part might get a little bit technical, but yeah, we will try. Okay, so let's say the chaos conjecture. Conje chaos conjecture is a conjecture about the isoparametric coefficient of uh, log concave densities. So let's say, let's define these things. So what is the uh, isoparametric coefficient? So first you need a density or a convex body. So the then for convex body, then the density is a uniform distribution over the convex body. For example, this uh, polygon here, uh, polytope here. Or, uh, and then the isoparametric coefficient is the infimum over all partitions of this uh, uh, density, like this space into two parts, S and S complement. And this uh, boundary measure divided by one part of the measure, the minimum of the minimum one part of measure. So the boundary measure is, uh, is a limit. Like you think about you have uh, cut the space into two parts and then take the, uh, you have this mid width in the middle and then you let the epsilon tend to, tend to zero and you get this boundary measure. So you want to compute um, how large is boundary measure compared to this uh, two parts. So what does this mean? So somehow it means that uh, it somehow characterizes the width of this, uh, this, this convex body or this density, right? So imagine if you have a sphere, then um, like most cuts with the PS equals to one half, they, they will have a very large boundary measure, right? So this is good, uh, have large isoparametric coefficient. But if you have certain objects with uh, uh, a bottleneck or with uh, a long shape, that, that uh, isoparametric coefficient might be small. Right? So let's explain this um, through some examples. So, um, so people study hydroparametric coefficient in other fields as well, not just in public and um, uh, in uh, statistics. So here, uh, basically, uh, uh, why are so those always wrong? So this is actually a physics problem, of course, but you can try to kind of model this problem as uh, uh, isoparametric problem. So you want to find basically a surface such that uh, such that uh, the, the isoparametric coefficient, which is a minimum over all kinds of uh, uh, surfaces, such that uh, the uh, isoparametric the, the isometry is achieved. Right? So you can say that actually you can prove that actually if the underlying density is like a uniform distribution over a convex set in 3D, then the sphere is one that actually uh, achieves isoparametric coefficients. So that uh, minimize the, 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 the surface area over the volume with a fixed volume here over the volume of this. And then, uh, yeah, so with physics, you can kind of, uh, you, you can kind of say that, oh, this, this bubble has to be run so, because it wants to minimize this kind of quantity, minimize this energy. Um, and then, yeah, so at the parametric coefficients, so, Typically, you can imagine that if you have a convex set, so if you have like a round shape set, no matter how you cut the space, yeah, you will have a pretty large boundary, right? And, but if you have this kind of set with a bottleneck, uh, this is like a sunglass kind of shape uh, set. And then if you cut here, uh, the boundary measure will be very small, but the PS and the S complement, they were about to be one half, right? In this sense that you can make this thing, this bottleneck as small as possible, and then you can make this uh, hydroparametric coefficient very small, okay? So that's some intuition about this uh, hydroparametric coefficient. And now like, let's define this uh, log concave density. So chaos conjecture does not try to characterize the hydroparametric coefficient for every set, so only deal with log concave density. Hopefully this log concave property actually gives you some uh, good properties, like good uh, uh, bond for the isoparametric coefficients. So uh, a probability density is log concave if, if it satisfies this inequality. Basically, uh, when you take the log of this uh, density, it is uh, concave, uh, the usual concave, concavity formula. Uh, so you have a Gaussian exponential logistic density there. 
log on k because the density is proportional to e to the minus f with f a convex function. And the uniform distribution over convex that is actually a large class of log on k densities. Uh, it's proportional to indicator of k. So actually, so if you take the log of this density, some parts will be zero. So that's why the log on k definition is written in this without taking the log. We want to include uh, this uh, uniform distribution over convex set. And, and this will be like our main running examples actually uh, throughout the talk. So the chaos, now let's uh, state the chaos conjecture. The chaos conjecture states that for any log concave density, you, uh, you, you can bound its isoparametric coefficient by a universal constant C divided by some normalization constant. So you, here you, you, you need some normalization constant because imagine if you have uh, a density that is very elongated in one direction and very thin in, in, in very thin, uh, 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 in, 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 in like, it's like the, those, uh, the, the sunglass shape I've shown. Like, yeah, and, or, or not, not, not sunglass shape, but uh, the long kind of, a long line kind of shape. And then even if it's like a convex uh, body, it's log concave, then it's, um, uh, this isoparametric coefficient can be very small if you made this uh, very long, right? And so here the normalization is basically saying that uh, uh, if you constrain the, the covariance of the density to be a fixed uh, matrix A, and then you divide by the square root of the spectral norm of this A, that's the normalization in the chaos conjecture. But there's actually a simplification that people usually do that uh, in the isotropic form, meaning that we only deal with the isotropic log concave densities, which is mean zero and variance identity. So then this chaos conjecture is stated as uh, uh, that the isoparametric coefficient of all log concave densities is uh, lower bounded by C. All isotropic log concave densities lower bounded by C. C is a universal constant. So well, we can actually prove an upper bound of the same form uh, and actually show, tell us, showed that uh, uh, in 1995, that half spaces. So if you only make the cuts, which are half spaces, um, you can show that actually the, that, that then, yeah, then gives the upper bound for this uh, isoparametric coefficient, right? Then you can show that actually there's a, this is a constant. So it's upper bounded by a constant. Um, so uh, the difficult part is, uh, is like whether we can prove this uh, is a lower bound. So yeah, so also since the upper bound is achieved by const, uh, half spaces by a constant, you can also think about the normalization that is happening in the KLS conjecture. Uh, is the based on the normalization for half, half spaces. So it's like, if I constrain myself to all the half spaces, what will be the normalization needed? And that is, uh, uh, that is this quantity. Mm. Okay, so the KLS conjecture is famous because it's related to uh, several other conjectures. Uh, so the, the kind of most visual kind of conjecture uh, is this uh, Sinshio conjecture. Um, it tells you about like how concentrated or how, uh, how what where are the mass of uh, isotropic log concave densities. So, um, Antila, Ball, and uh, Perry Sinaki in 2003 they state in this conjecture as uh, for any isotropic log concave density, um, there exists a universal constant. Uh, so, sorry, there exists a universal constant such that for any log concave isotropic log concave density. The Sinshio constant is proper bounded by C. What is Sinshio constant? So the Sinshio constant is uh, basically the average deviation of the norm of uh, uh, X around square root D. So you, have, you draw your random variable according to density P. So the mass is uh, centered around uh, it's saying that the mass is basically around square root D. Uh, the square root D is basically the, 
the square root of the uh, the, the trace of the variance right, in the in the isotropic case, uh, and the width is of order constant. Um, yeah, so the mass is super is is concentrated in this in this sense is around this uh, sphere of square d. Okay, so um, so it is actually not hard to prove that if you only deal with the standard log on cave density, uh, sorry, standard Gaussian density rather than uh, arbitrary isotropic log on cave density, uh, you can show that this uh, concentrates around this sphere of square root, radius square d and uh, with width uh, of the constant. And it's kind of saying that for other log on cave densities, as long as it has identity covariance matrix, this, this type of concentration properties is similar. Um, so the sinkhole conjecture is actually shown to be equivalent to KLS conjecture up to log factors. So um, one direction the KLS implies sinkhole, that is the kind of the easy part by uh, Shiger's inequality. But the other direction is not trivial. It was shown by Erdan in 2013 with the uh, the same uh, where they, he invented this stochastic localization landmark. He also showed that the Tinshaw conjecture implies chaos conjecture up to log constants. Um, so here, basically, yeah. So here, um, we when we talk about this, like we want a universal constant, but uh, we're we're not there yet. Like as we, the, the 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 research is basically try to get these constants as small as possible in terms of uh, dimension D dependency. Okay, so there's also much earlier conjecture, it's famous conjecture called slicing conjecture. It's uh, uh, introduced by Bugen in 1986. Uh, it says that there exists a universal constant C such that for any uniform distribution over a convex set, there exists a hyperplane section uh, which uh, kind of which is quite large, the vol with, with large volume, which is kind of intuitive, right? It's uh, you have convex sets, and the convex set by definition it cannot have this kind of bottleneck uh, uh, shape everywhere. So you have to find uh, some direction uh, that uh, the the section is large, right? Um, but actually, it's actually. Uh, uh, intuitive, but the, when it's stated in this form, it's very difficult deal, to deal with uh, this conjecture. Um, so in 1988, Bo actually stated an uh, uh, equivalent statement of the slicing conjecture that is that uh, exists a universal constant C such that for any isotropic log and field density P, we have this slicing constant is upper bounded by a universal constant, one this universal. Constancy. The slicing constant for isotropic log compute density is in a quite simple form. It's just look at the density at uh, point zero and take the power one over d. Okay. So why is actually this? Uh, so this actually this uh, this slicing constant is also related to this kind of concentration high dimensional concentration properties. So here is a theorem actually. Uh, if you have a slicing constant, you can get a very good uh, high dimensional concentration properties for all uh, isotropic log concave densities. So the theorem by Balfis 2006 states that uh, um, the deviation uh, so the, 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 of this uh, square root of the, the norm of the random vector drawn, uh, drawn from the isotropic log concave density it will have a sub exponential tail. And the place where it starts to have this type of sub exponential tail is roughly basically the slicing constant times square root d. So if the slicing conjecture is true, basically it's saying that from this square root d radius, you have this, this type of sub exponential tail. Well, if you cannot, yeah, if this slicing constant is of other square root d, then this property is slightly worse, right? So you want this kind of thing to be able to prove this thing uh, very close to constant. So, uh, so that this performs basically uh, like, uh, like exponential kind of density or, yeah. 
Okay, so the chaos conjecture implies the other two conjectures. You can show that up to log factors. We all ignore the. Oh, actually, here in not even yet. Yeah, it's actually up to constant factors. You can show these uh, three inequalities, and the first one is basically showing the uh, inverse idle uh, inverse of the idle idle parametric constant in the chaos conjecture. It's larger than the thing show constant, and it, this is can be shown in uh, by Chigurh's inequality. It also summarized in the uh, Milman paper in 2009. And then the thing show constant is larger than the slicing constant. This is actually shown by Eldon and Klatak in 2011. Um, so yeah, if we show that the, the KOS conjecture that this is a constant, then we can also show thing show conjecture and slicing conjecture. Um, that's why I actually uh, put the title only focusing on the chaos conjecture. Well, it's not actually the, the, the oldest the conjecture, the slicing conjecture is the oldest one. Um, okay, so here I'm going to talk about a little bit uh, relation to the MCME sampling theory. Can to explain my past going there? I am not actually a convex geometry expert by training, but I kind of study and uh, MCMC sampling problems that uh, arise in statistics. I try to understand uh, their mixing time of the con convergence of those uh, sampling algorithms. And it is usually, uh, the idle parametric coefficient is usually a key quantity that arise uh, in when you try to prove mixing time of uh, sampling algorithms. And typically yeah, it comes like in one over uh, the isotropic idle parametric coefficient constant constant square, this type of. Thing. So you kind of care about this idle parametric coefficient. And if you want to establish a theory for sampling over all log compute distributions, then you care about the KOS constant. And also, yeah, um, in some situations, this has weird implications. Like uh, if the KOS conjecture is true, uh, in the problem, like uh, some, some problems I study in high dimension, the uniform sampling on polytopes, um, it kind of implies there's no need to design very sophisticated sampling algorithm in some settings. So let me explain it a little bit in, in more details. Um, so we have this problem of like uh, sampling from polytope, uniform sampling from polytopes. So the polytope is just defined by a linear equation AX, S and B. Here is a polytope with five constraints and dimension two, then this matrix A is just five times times two. And when you try to solve, uh, so so yeah, people care about this type of sampling problems because uh, you don't, you are not satisfied with the optimization problem that you want to diversify your solution or um, uh, there are cases where you actually, the, the uh, you want to compute the volume of the polytope and then the sampling algorithm becomes uh, uh, useful. And the simplest algorithm in this type of setting uh, for sampling from convex set is called the ball walk. So it means that it, each iteration, um, the proposal distribution of the sampling algorithm is just a ball. And then based on whether the point is uh, uh, it's a uniform distribution over a ball, and depending on whether this point is inside the polytope or outside the polytope, you, you either accept or you reject, and then you work uh, with those small balls and walk around this polytope. So this type of algorithm has uh, mixing time uh, d square over uh, isoparametric coefficient square. If the polytope is in isotropic position, meaning that uh, we normalize it to mean zero and variance identity. So this is actually a good bond um, uh, together with the iteration cost. You can see the, the computational cost is basically MD to the cube over the idle parameter coefficient square. So if we can prove this idle parameter coefficient is of order constant, we get a D cube M kind of uh, uh, mix, mixing time bond uh, in terms of uh, iteration costs. So at the iteration, you check whether this linear equation is satisfied and that is the thing. But then there's also like a lot of people develop a lot of like sophisticated random work where at each iteration, you not only just check this uh, linear equations, but you also kind of want to adapt 
So the local geometry of the polytope, meaning that at each step, the, 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 the proposal distribution is no longer a ball, but uh, some ellipsoid, for example, and they can work. And then uh, intuitively, yeah, if you have kind of weird shaped polytope, like elongating one direction, those uh, adaptive kind of proposal distributions will be better. Uh, this, so they are better. So in terms of making time, you can prove that it does not have this uh, as a parametric coefficient dependency. You can prove that some of the sophistry work like John work is also a d square, but their partition cost is no longer um, uh, uh, this uh, MD, but actually slightly larger because you kind of want need to invert a linear system. Of course, if you, yeah, if you listen to the previous uh, uh, um, uh, breakthrough talk, you yeah, you might say that oh, eventually maybe this this will get to uh, m times d rather than m times d omega like minus one, which is uh, the same as uh, ball work in some situations, like if the matrix multiplication or matrix inversion theory gets better, but currently there's a gap in here. So currently it means that if the polytope is in isotropic position, and if you can prove the KOS conjecture and then just means the ball work is already very good. It's, 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 you don't need to go to very sophisticated uh, uh, sampling algorithms in the case uh, where uh, this, uh, uh, Dimension is uh, is large, but uh, this uh, number of constraints is much larger than the dimension. Then you can see that it's uh, sorry good. It means some in some high dimensional geometry, in terms of high dimensional polytopes, you don't really need to adapt to the local geometry of the polytope. Those uh, those bars you you work by those bars is is enough. Gives you very fast mixing. Um, so this is something kind of very intriguing for me. Of course, this problem is not completely solved. It's still open that uh, what's the minimum like dimension dependency you can get. And people will conjecture that is around, like the, the mixing time should be around D if you, but this is the, these algorithms are still quite far from D. Um, okay. So then, um, yeah, I'll talk about the previous progress on the KOS conjecture. And then I'll talk about the, 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 the proof techniques. So, um, So you can derive the KS uh, bound by a single conjecture, like we mentioned. Uh, uh, it is via like Eldan's paper in 2013 that uh, if you can get a single constant, you can get a lower bound on the isoparameter coefficient in the KOS conjecture. So, uh, so actually, this uh, this uh, this progress in single conjecture. Uh, has yeah, it's, it's very active. Yeah, people get this uh, dimension dependency in the initial constant that goes from d to the one half to d to the one third in 2011 in the Gedon Milman paper. And this type of proofs usually are, are consistent. Actually, are basically uh, some kind of projection and projection of some high dimensional density, and then show some symmetric property of the uh, projected density. And it's very kind of geometric kind of uh, proofs. Um, so they also paper directly attack the KLS conjecture. So in the KLS 1995 paper, actually they introduced this localization lemma that uh, uh, shows that uh, the inverse isoparametric coefficient is of order uh, d to the one half. And then in 2017, uh, Liam and Pala used the stochastic localization lemma idea from Elden and proved that uh, this dimension dependency is d to the one fourth. And in the 2020 paper, we have uh, the dimension dependency becomes d to the log log d over d to the one half. So this exponent goes to zero when d tends to infinity. So uh, in a large D regime, if we ignore all the constants, that is the typical setting in the theoretical computer science. But if we want to ignore all the set on constants, then this, this is better than any D to the alpha with alpha constant uh, bound. So that's why we call it uh, almost constant lower bound. Um, so here's the, the timeline. Yeah, so in the 1995, you get D to the one half. And then using those uh, thin shell conjecture bounds, you get uh, 
to the D to the one third. And then stochastic localization. So stochastic localization was invented around here and to get D to the one fourth. And then we get D to the small of one. It's log D over log log. Log, 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 D over log, D. Okay. So, uh, so in the next, I will introduce basically the localization lemma. So the localization lemma and the stochastic localization lemma, they share a word, uh, localization. So I kind of explain what is localization in this literature um, and how the main idea works. So the localization lemma is, Basically, this lemma, it looks complicated, but let me explain. So you start with uh, two high-dimensional integrals. And these two functions, g and h, they are semi-continuous. So they're uh, continuous uh, oh, in a lot of places, but it allowed to have some jumps. Um, so if these two semi-continuous integrals are positive, in the localization lemma science says that you can find a one-dimensional integral, uh, one dimension of fine function L, so that the one dimensional integral is still positive. So basically, uh, deal, the idea is dealing with high dimensional uh, integrals, so high dimensional inequalities is difficult. But if I can find a one dimensional integral uh, that deal with one dimensional in in inequalities, that might be easier. Okay, so this is called Needle decomposition because this actually this um, this is also called needle decomposition because this this thing this L you can think about this some kind of uh, area of inf infinite decimal cone that you are integrating your G and H over, and it's called a like look like a needle and this needle decomposition idea actually goes back to Payne and Weinberger in 1960 when they were trying to prove some Poincaré inequality and this is actually. Uh, uh, this uh, concrete kind of lemma to 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 actually to rewrite this uh, this idea and specific for this uh, uh, KOS conjecture type setting. So, how do we use this uh, localization lemma? Uh, let's try to prove a simpler isoparametric inequality, which is uh, the diameter isoparametric inequality. So, uh, in the diameter in isoparametric inequality. Uh, you want to prove that for any partition S2, S3, S1, S3 of the space, the, the middle part is larger than the minimum of the, the two parts around it. With this coefficient is the distance D S1, S2 divided by the diameter. So if you take the limit when S1, S2 two close to zero, then this one over D is basically the isoparametric uh, Coefficient, right? Um, here, so this this type of um, isoparametric uh, coefficient, you can relate it back to the KOS conjecture, because uh, if you assume that uh, it density is isotropic, meaning that the covariance is identity, then the effective diameter is of order square root d. Then you basically prove that uh, the the KOS conjecture with the isoparametric coefficient. Uh, one over square root d, right? Which is an okay bound, but it's not the, yeah, the, the best bound we can get. So let's explain actually how actually they use the, the localization lemma to, to get this bound. Um, so uh, the proof is by contradiction. So this high dimensional uh, inequality you want to prove, you can assume the converse. So meaning that there exists some partition so that this is not satisfied. And then uh, you will define two functions, G and H, which are, is in, which are the, the two integrals that start with in the localization lemma based on these two inequalities we get from the uh, contradiction, like the, the converse we assume. Okay, so they define this as G and, so this is G and this is H. Basically then you have like two, you have, sorry, you have two uh, integrals that integrates to positive value. And then you apply the localization lemma, meaning that you can find a needle so that uh, these two integrals in the one needle direction, 
they are all positive. And then basically you can partition the needle based on how the high dimensional space is partitioned. You get Z1, Z2, and Z3. And then you get a one dimensional inequality from the, 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 the high dimensional integral inequality, right? And this one dimensional in in inequality is basically a form of uh, um, one dimensional isoparametric inequality. And because you can show that this, this, this transformed density is also low concave if, uh, this, if G is low concave. And then one dimensional low concave uh, isoparametric inequality for low concave density is very easy to prove or not, not that easy, but you can prove it. It's harder, it's much easier to deal with one dimension than high dimensional. And then you will reach some kind of contradiction for certain gamma. So that's how you prove uh, a high dimensional isoparameter diameter, isoparametric inequality. You use the localization gamma to change the problem uh, to uh, one dimensional uh, isoparametric inequality. And you prove the one dimensional isoparametric inequality. And then you relate back to, to high dimensional case then to get the uh, isoparametric constant, okay? Um, so this idea will appear, appear again actually in the, in the later part. But before we do that, we, we kind of, we want to give some proof sketch of this localization lemma, how, how it works. It looks like a, a fancy uh, lemma, right? This, you have two high dimensional integral and you get, you, you get a needle that is one dimensional integral. How to get that to that needle? The idea is, uh, is uh, to play like fruit ninja with density. This is kind of a uh, kind of uh, a mobile game, like it's back to long, but it's actually a term quanted by uh, Ronan Eldon uh, in around 2013. Um, the idea is to, to cut, basically to cut the densities in some way. Um, so you have, you, let, we start with two high dimensional integrals uh, integral G and integral H, they are both positive. And then the first step is to find a bisecting half half plane capital H so that uh, it will divide the, the integral of G. And then since it divides the, uh, uh, since the integral of small H is positive, then either the left left part or the right part of this hyperplane uh, half space H has to be positive. So we take that part as positive. So what you have done after you have done this, uh, of so you, you you did this is that you basically reduced our uh, uh, integral that is on the entire RD space to uh, half space. On you, have, you get two integrals that are both positive on half space, right? Um, so you can repeatedly doing this actually as long as the kind of the effective dimension of that space is uh, is small is larger than two. And why is larger than two? I'll explain it. But we can repeat that many, many times. And there are, you need some kind of smart ways to say that you you do this time in the countable number of so you knew this procedure in the countable number of steps, and you can take the limit and you end up with a needle. So why is like you can only do up to dimension two is this the way they find a the bisecting half space is because uh, it's not an uh, arbitrary half space but it's also not a will as like a, does not have very explicit form. So you have an integral of G that is positive. How do you find a, a half space that divides it? So you will start with some random half space and then you fix some point and then you kind of rotate this half space. And when you rotate this half space to 360 degree, the, the integral on one side of half space, on the left side of half space has gone through from positive number to negative number, right? So it has to go through zero. So you, this is an implicit way basically to define this half space. But when, uh, as this is half space always exists if your effect dimension is kind of large, but when you basically only have a one dimensional needle, you cannot do this kind of uh, uh, rotating and find this kind of half space. So that's why uh, you end up with a needle, not just a, a 
something else or higher dimension or some higher lower dimension thing. Um, okay, so this is kind of this uh, localization lemma. The, the, the good thing, the advantage of this localization lemma is that it easily proves this uh, diameter as a parametric inequality. Um, we have seen that because that uh, your high dimensional integral, uh, the high dimensional problem, uh, no matter how you basically, no matter how you find that needle, the diameter is uh, constant. There's an invariant quantity throughout this, uh, this uh, localization lemma procedure, right? So the lamb low dimensional inequality with the diameter D, uh, so the high dimensional inequality require the dimension D, uh, diameter D, the low dimensional problem also have diameter D. So you can kind of get back uh, from low dimensional result to high dimensional result. Okay, the same thing happens if you want to prove algorithmic coefficient for alpha strongly low concave densities. Alpha strongly low concave meaning that uh, it is it can be written as a form e to the minus uh, f, with f is uh, strongly convex functions, and so it means that the, the, the density has some kind of curvature. And in this case, it's easy to prove by a localization lemma because uh, if you start with uh, alpha strongly low concave density, you cut this space and the one dimensional needle will always be uh, alpha strongly low concave. And then the one dimensional inequality can be related back to the high dimensional inequality. But in general, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not, it does not quite work to prove the uh, KLS conjecture because the KLS conjecture is a normalization factor is actually about the, the variance of the density. And, the covariance of the density and the high dimensional covariance of density is identity. We wish the one, one dimensional uh, needle also has var variance uh, one, but actually in general, you cannot prove this. You don't have much control when you do this, uh, 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 like through ninja or like this cutting the needle might be lying in the very long direction or might, might be lying in this very short direction. And, um, the needle might be as long as like of order square root d rather than of order one. So then you will not get a, a, a constant uh, con as a parametric coefficient in the QS conjecture. And the, yeah, let me let, let us reflect a little, a little bit on the high level strategy. Basically, um, you want to prove a high dimensional as a parametric inequality of this form, but you end up proving a one dimensional as a parametric coefficient uh, inequality which is uh, much easier to deal with. But the, the, the deal is that you need this one dimensional inequality, this, uh, this gamma you can relate back to the high dimensional the ones, right? So in the localization lemma, there's the many things there, the, the sign of these two integrals are kept constant, quite kept invariant in this thing. But in other proof things, there's something you kept constant, uh, invariant, but you also want like, uh, you be able to relate the one dimensional inequality to the high dimensional inequalities. And in the KOS conjecture case, you, you do want to control the, dense, the variance of the density where, when you do this uh, procedure of like, uh, like massaging or changing the high dimensional density to a low dimensional density. Um, but actually in the current, in the, in the localization lemma, you don't have much control. Uh, Okay, so let's, now let's introduce the Eldan stochastic localization lemma, which is actually the proof technique we use to, to get our uh, current uh, results. So the question Eldan uh, has faced with is basically, uh, is it possible to have a better control of the cuts when you play this uh, uh, through ninja? Basically, you, uh, is it possible to cut the densities in a better way? Um, Rather than this uh, uh, this uh, localization lemma, we have seen that you have to rotate something, and you don't have explicit control of how you rotate the, the half spaces and cut the densities. So uh, he has many attempts like this. Are some slides seamlessly seamlessly copied from his uh, slides in early slides around 2013. Um, he his first attempt was trying to control the cuts with random cuts rather than this rotating and stop at some arbitrary point. Uh, you just introduce those random cuts. 
And here it means that you start with some density uniform distribution over this uh, convex set K. You get a random direction, you cut it, you get K1. And then you, get, you can get another cut uh, random and you get K2. And you want to reduce uh, a high dimensional isoparametric inequality that is on K to the high dimensional, uh, the, 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 the lower dimensional isoparametric inequality that is on K1, K2, and K like many steps, right? So the good thing in this procedure is that the volume ratio is uh, fixed. So if you start with some arbitrary initial set of size one half, this volume ratio of S over SK is always concentrated around one half. That is a good property, this volume of S is fixed. So, but then what you also want to control is the, 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 the idle parametric coefficient, right? You want the idle parametric coefficient is also conserved, then you can prove it. But actually in this procedure, we don't know, or it's hard to get this uh, as a parametric coefficient controlled, or it's hard to get basically the variance of the density controlled. So you, you have those random cuts, but this random cut it will end up somewhere, but it's hard to, uh, to, to bound this, uh, or it, it, the, 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 the variance of those uh, densities you end up with. Um, so then he comes with the second attempt in controlling the cuts. So instead of like truncating the half spaces with a big knife or like uh, chopping the half spaces. They can just multiply this uh, uh, densities with small random linear functions. So you transform the um, densities in a small, in a smooth way. Um, so here say like F0 is a uniform distribution over K. So I try to use some color to highlight uh, the density change. The, the dark color means the density increase, the light color that density decreased. So you find one direction, uh, you multiply by one plus epsilon x transpose theta. Like, so then on this side, on the right side of this uh, hyperplane, uh, the density has increased a little bit. On the other side, decreased a little bit. So you can do this again with uh, like uh, several random cuts. The second random cut in this direction, then this side increased a little decreases. So you can see that if you take epsilon to be small, this is like, a smoother transformation of the density than the, the, the previous kind of uh, approach. And some properties about it is it, it actually no longer keeps the density ratio, the volume ratio between S and K. So in the idle parametric inequality, you try to prove PS is larger than some constant over the, the P boundary of S is larger than constant times of PS. And, and PS complement, but then this uh, ratio does not constant. You need other ways to, to control this uh, other parametric inequality. But this epsilon actually is handy because you can make epsilon 10 to zero and then it becomes a continuous procedure. And you have, like we will see that it has many, you have other ways, many ways to deal with this continuous procedure. And then also uh, because we multiply by a small linear function, it will make appear a Gaussian part in the density. Um, so you can see that if you happen to multiply these two linear function with opposite directions, x1 and minus x1, and this is approximately one minus epsilon square x1 square. This is approximately exponential of epsilon square x1 square. It means that uh, actually uh, you are multiply your density by a minus epsilon square x1 square which is actually adding some kind of curvature or Gaussian part to your density. Um, so that leads to uh, his uh, actually stochastic like localization uh, formulation. So stochastic localization is actually a stochastic differential equation that characterizes uh, a transformation of the log concave density P uh, to PT. So you can see that the PT, um, when, yeah, when, so in this uh, stochastic differential equation case, basically you already let epsilon 10 to zero and you have uh, uh, a Brownian motion change in, in, the, in, the, in the intercept term and you have some drift term. And then on, on the, 
on the quadratic term term, it's, uh, it's calculated by some control matrix CT for now, I assume just as the identity. So um, in the quadratic term, you just basically increase, you multiply by a more and more stronger and stronger uh, Gaussian term, but the intercept term is interesting. You have a Brownian motion term here. And with this, uh, uh, if this is form of the transformation of the density PT, you can show that it's actually related to the Erdan's uh, second attempt. You can show that a PT is a martingale and it satisfies this property for, for any X. So you fix, you fix X, the density at point X is just the density multiplied by uh, one plus uh, the linear function and uh, a random di direction. Here, the data is changed to this DWT, this uh, random motion part. And so this is basically the stochastic differential equation characterizes the transformation of the density. And then we can, uh, yeah, sorry, I actually don't have time to, to this, but uh, actually it's starting with some uniform distribution. Uh, you can do simulation to show that actually eventually, so you transform the density smoothly and eventually it will come up, uh, th there will be a Gaussian part that come up dominates in this thing. But how do you use this localization uh, technique to prove an isoparametric inequality? So what you want to prove is this uh, boundary measure is larger than uh, minimum of PS, PS complements with some uh, isoparametric coefficient here, right? Here we restrict us to subsets of measure one half because the uh, uh, results in, in the Milman 2009, uh, you can restrict yourself, it's enough to show that the isoparametric coefficient, uh, the isoparametric is always attained by subset of measure one half is enough to show it this. Then um, you can see that uh, uh, the way they are proving it um, is to by transforming the density. So by marking the property, the density at time t, the, the boundary measure is the same as the original uh, boundary measure. This is martingale property. And this is a transform density. For the transform density, since you added some Gaussian part to it, it will have a, a isoparametric inequality or the measure coefficient. And so it's like for strongly log concave densities, which has a Gaussian part in it, uh, it will have the isoparametric coefficient of order uh, that it depends on the covariance matrix that is, that is added. Um, the quadratic part that is added. And then for this transformed uh, density, you want to relate back to the original density. And if you can show that actually the, the, the volume of PTS remains between one quarter and three quarter, that then you can basically, this is one, this is one half, one half. Then you, if you can control this probability, then the final isoparametric coefficient you get it's basically um, the amount of Gaussian you add it to your density. And then this probability, like you can control this PT. So the problem now becomes an analytic problem. It's no longer a geometric problem. You want to start, you want to study this uh, stochastic differential equation that is characterized by uh, this type of static differential equation. And then you want to control BT and the PTS. And let me briefly, talk about how to control this BT and PTS. Um, so the BT, if you choose the CT control matrix to be identity, so the BT oh. just linearly increased, yeah. which is- uh, Lassie, can I disturb yeah. you for a second? So we are at 7.56, maybe wrap up in a minute and then we ask people if they have questions. Yes, yeah, I will try to finish this part. Yeah, this intuition part. So yeah, so, um, so the, B, the BT is kind of easy to control if you take the control matrix to be identity, but uh, the, the control of the volume of PTS, uh, you can take the derivative and look at, try to bond it. You can see it depends on the spectral norm of the AT. AT is the covariance matrix of the density at time T. And then the whole problem boils down to control the spectral norm as uh, AT. Uh, so the controlling the covariance matrix, the spectral norm of the covariance matrix at time t. And yeah, so you take the derivative and to, to approach the spectral norm, 
people use the potential function, uh, you raise to the power Q and then take power one over Q. So Liam and Pala use the, the, the power Q equals two and CT equals identity to show their bond. And basically um, they get a stochastic differential equation and solve it. You can control these two parts. The D to the minus one quarter is the Gaussian part you add. And then you can control this part I, of other one, and then they get this uh, uh, lower bound of the isoparametric coefficient in the KOS conjecture. And so what we did in one minute, uh, we basically, uh, like the nature extension is take larger power in the potential function and larger power means that you get more precise, uh, you closer to the actual spectral norm you want to control, but there are some difficult terms uh, when you take derivative of this term. And you can summarize actually our proof is basically trying to actually control this potential function like this complicated differential equation in two stages, which is not like in previously, they only control this potential in, in one stage. And we get this type of bootstrap results, meaning that if you have some KOS bound of other one over D to the beta, you get a one over D to the beta minus beta over eight Q. And this allows you to bootstrap this uh, lemma many times and you get uh, uh, log, this log factors. Um, okay, so I don't have time to explain this part, but um, yeah, so some takeaways is if you deal with this log concave densities or convex bodies in research, basically the, the improvement of the KOS conjecture uh, allows to improve the essential conjecture and also the uh, the constant in the Bauhaus lemma. So in those concentration inequalities uh, are improved. And also um, the localization lemma and Eldon stochastic localization lemma, for me, they are kind of very powerful uh, proof technique or also beautiful proof technique to reduce the high dimensional geometric problem to actual uh, analytic problem. Some gives you some handle to deal with uh, uh, high dimensional uh, geometric problems. And what's next? So our result is not a complete resolution of the KOS conjecture. Uh, you may need other proof techniques to actually reach a uh, uh, universal constant bond in the KOS conjecture. And yeah, so the, we, we don't know, actually we have reached the full potential of the stochastic localization scheme. And um, there, recently there are some, starting to have some other applications of uh, Eldon stochastic localization scheme in other high dimensional phenomena. And that is also interesting. And let me end the chart. Thank you. Thank you so much for this, uh, you know, fascinating talk. And I'd like to see if uh, we have like no minutes. But is there some question that's a burning question? I don't see questions in the Q and A. But I know among the panelists, somebody already asked if you could extend the talk by twenty minutes because they wanted to hear more detail. So is there? Uh, one question or two that um, maybe a panelist or uh, an attendant would like to ask? Um, sure, I, I had a question. So um, going forward to get a constant factor uh, K-less conjecture, is it that the, st the stochastic localization technique is not good enough? As in, if you ran an experiment and look at the one dimensional sections it produces, it's not they're not concentrated enough, or is it just that they can't bound the uh, bound the quantities and all? Yeah, that, that's uh, that's a very good question. Uh, actually, you can show that even for very simple uh, convex bodies, if you just apply Eldon stochastic localization, you will at least have a log d factor. But yeah, log d factor is good. Actually, uh, our bond, the current bond, is actually worse than log d factor. It's d to the log log d over log d is, is worse than log d factor. But um, so the Eldon stochastic localization lemma will lead to, to a log factor, but even that we, we cannot reach it because we don't have a full understanding of that uh, stochastic differential equation. So maybe there's need additional understanding. But uh, um, on, yeah, if you want, but if you want to go beyond this log d factor, then you might other techniques, we would say, yeah. Or you can need a bigger big modification of this Eldon stochastic localization scheme. Uh, thanks. Thank you. Anybody else? Then I, 
If not, uh, then I think that, uh, okay, here is a question uh, by Adil. Does it have any implication on the constant in the Telegram inequality? Sorry, sorry. I, it's in Telegram inequality. Yeah, yeah. All right. Would you like to respond to this question? Uh, I don't. I don't know exactly which paragraph in quality we talk about. Yeah, which call? I, I was actually wondering that too. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I think that at this point we're gonna thank you again for a, a very very instructive talk and uh, explaining to us so well, uh, you know, so what has led up to your result and including. And I think that there's some people who want you to continue talking, but I think they're gonna to have to reach you offline. And uh, again, I'm very grateful that you joined us and in in you've given us this breakthrough talk. And uh, yeah. thank you, I appreciate it very much and hope to see you in person in the fall, in one way or yeah, another. Thank you, yeah, thank you for the questions. I'm sorry, I just, yeah, went a little bit uh, out of time, but sorry oh, about that, yeah. It looks like you have a lot more to say also. Thank you very much, bye. Thank you, bye.